what I'm going to be talking about today is machine learning for healthcare data. Um, and this is really a, basically like an overview of work that we've done here at Duke in terms of trying to come up with machine learning methods that can predict different different diseases or the course of different diseases. Um, and then trying to a little bit of trying to implement them within the hospital system. And in particular, what I'm going to look at um, are electronic health records. Um, uh, so we've done a whole bunch of gassing process-based modeling for things like chronic kidney disease, predicting the course of chronic kidney disease, and predicting uh, sepsis. So we're going to talk a little bit about electronic health records. There was nothing on my slides that you guys missed. Um, in terms of uh, the guessing process-based models that I'm talking about, the hospital system is particularly inter interested in sepsis. Sepsis is um, like a life-threatening condition or infection that people often get in the hospital. And so they're very um, interested in finding out when that potentially is and being able to treat it as soon as possible. Um, another, th another thing that exists um, that I'm going to be talking about is um, there are a couple of national national databases um, that allow us to do things like predict um, whether or not somebody is going to have surgical complications. And using those database, we look at bit databases, we look at transfer learning models because our hospital is one of many hospitals and we want to be able to say we can leverage these kinds of um, national databases in order to make the best predictions for our individual hospital um, as, as, as it stands. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is mobile apps, and this kind of comes from a place where um, once you're dealing with people on an outpatient basis instead of an inpatient basis, most of what actually happens to them, say they have some kind of chronic disease like diabetes or the, what we look at uh, in particular is multiple scler sclerosis, um, most of what they're experiencing is happening outside of me a medical setting. So getting data for these kinds of outpatient chronic diseases is actually really hard. Um, and so we have worked on developing mobile apps for, in particular, multiple sclerosis in order to try to record more data, and we're just getting data from that now. Um, and so that's kind of looking forward and a little bit advertising our, our, our app from which we hope to get data about outpatient chronic disease. Okay, so let me start with chronic kidney disease. Um, so this is the story of somebody who came into the hospital here at Duke. Um, on the y-axis is EGFR, which lets you... Um, which, which lets you, which gives you some clue about what their kidney function level is like, and on the x-axis is age. And so he first presented himself to the hospital system here at age 47. He had untreated diabetes and high blood pressure, normal kidney functioning, but with some evidence of kidney damage and no regular medical care. By age 49, um, his kidney functioning was now half of what it should be. At age 51, for the first time, the kidney, his kidney functioning was at 20% of what it should be, and he was referred to a kidney specialist. And then three months later, he presented himself to the emergency room with kidney failure and crash-started dialysis. And crash-starting dialysis is actually um, really dangerous because it's really dangerous for the patient. All kinds of lines have to be inserted into your body very quickly. And it's also incredibly expensive for the hospital system. It's probably the most, the single most expensive medical procedure that somebody can have. And then he basically lived out the rest of his life until he was 63 years old on dialysis. And so for us, this was um, basically, this, this was a bunch of missed opportunities, right? We had missed opportunities to prevent or delay kidney failure. Um, and we also had missed opportunities to, pre to prepare for a kidney failure. Because if you know like a year in advance that somebody is going to end up going on dialysis, there are a whole bunch of procedures that they can have to insert lines in their body that are not nearly as dangerous. So 42% of people um, start dialysis having no prior nephrology care, and less than 10% of people with moderate chronic kidney disease, and less than half of people with severe chronic kidney disease are even aware that there's something that's wrong with their kidneys. And so what we really wanted was to be able to say, okay, if you look back at, um, at this person's um, course, this course uh, of chronic kidney disease, what you can see is a function where his kidney functioning, where, where his kidney functioning is getting worse and worse. And so we'd like to be able to use that to predict that he's going to end up needing to 
to go on dialysis or end up predicting what his course of, of chronic kidney disease is going to look at. And so um, one of the things that we started looking at was this gasoline process model, um, where the gasoline process um, has a rate function, which is, or a mean function, which is dependent on a lot of different things. Um, and so there's a population level effect um, where uh, it's our pop population in general tends to have a trajectory that looks like, like so, right? So we're really looking at, um, at uh, covariates XI for an individual times some kind of lambda, which is some kind of um, population level weights. And then we say, okay, of this in this population, they're in a particular subclass. So the subclass is going to define what we think that their, their trajectory looks like on a large scale. And that, that class is the ZIP that you see. Um, and so we can come up with a whole bunch of weights that are related to what we think their trajectory class looks like. And then, of course, individual deviations off of that, right? So we have um, BIP, which provides sort of linear weights, which say, okay, how, do, how much do I think that this individual is deviating off of what, what I expect for their group, the ZIP as a whole? And then we use some kind of ornstein ullenbach uh, covariance function. So with that basic model in mind, there were a lot of things that we needed to do. So one of the things that we needed to do is to be able to leverage um, a large number of lab values. Um, and so um, you, you could imagine that this person's lab values are actually correlated, right? So if they've got chronic kidney disease, the way in which um, their lab values deviate from normal is it is gonna, they're going to be related, right? So it's like if you have a low creatinine, you could have a lower BUN, um, for example. Um, and so we want to look at, at um, ways in which we can um, include this, this correlation in, in our Gaussian process model. And so one of the ways that we ended up doing this is we said, okay, this person's long-term individual deviation weights B are correlated through, through a Gaussian, but we also said that their class, the class that they belong to and what we would expect for their lab, individual lab value trajectories, um, that, that ZIP, that class label, um, is correlated across the different lab values. And so we use a mixture of multinomials in order to do that. So in this way, we're basically correlating all of the individual lab trajectories that, that a person has. Okay, and so we looked at running this experiment um, at Duke at using the Duke data. Um, and so we looked at um, six variables of interest, EGFR, which you remember was that um, measure of kidney functioning that I presented um, in, in the first couple of slides, and five other lab values which are relevant to chronic kidney disease. And we looked at a co cohort of 44,000 patients at Duke um, with at least moderate chronic kidney disease and a bunch of measures for EGFR. Having uh, a measure for EGFR mostly depends on having a, a, a particular lab value, a creatinine lab taken, and that's a very common lab test. So there are a lot of people who fall into that category. Um, and then for each patient that we're looking at, we use data before some particular time T in order to predict future lab values. Um, and then we look at um, uh, uh, mean average error across different test patients um, in, in future time windows. And what we see is that actually including this kind of correlation, this correlation across labs really helps and using this, this uh, guessing process model really helps. Um, and so this was in a sense a success story, but not, not totally a success story because this hasn't really been adopted fully by the hospital. So our goal at the end of the day is really to get doctors to round using these tools with their patients. And what they said to us, what they came back and sent to us is, what we'd really like is for you to instead provide us with a list of people rank ordered by how worried we should be about them and that will help us determine what order in which to see them when, when we round on them. But this kind of trajectory model, uh, which is nice and informative, is not something that they're necessarily going to be able to right away um, incorporate into their rounds. 
Um, another thing that we looked at was saying, okay, if you have chronic kidney disease, you also can have other things go wrong with you. So for example, you could have a heart attack or a stroke. And one of the things that we'd like to be able to predict is um, whether or not you're going to have one of these adverse events together with the course of your chronic kidney disease. Um, and basically, we just used um, a, a conditionally independent model for this. So we kept the gassing process model that I showed you in the last few slides, but we also said there's a point process model for these uh, bad events like the heart attacks or the strokes that we're also going to incorporate into our predictions overall for this individual. Um, and we can tie the two together, uh, which we did, right? So we can say that the, um, the rate function for having some kind of adverse event, like a heart attack or a stroke, depends on the mean and mean and slope of the um, risk function that I showed you, of the, of the overall kidney functioning of that individual patient. And that's what you see with the MIFT and the M prime IFT, right? Those are the mean and slopes of the gassing process function that I was showing you before. Um, and again, we tested this framework where we're also now predicting um, these adverse events along with the, um, the, the trajectory for their chronic kidney disease on 23,450 patients um, in, in the Duke, Duke Hospital system. Um, we looked at, uh, at the, of the people that we looked at, about 13%. Um, had a stroke and about 17% had a heart attack. Um, and we incorporated a lot of baseline covariants like age and race and gender and other diseases that would also um, potentially affect what was going on with them. Um, and basically this is, um, this is just an example of joint modeling results. We had a paper at, um, at UAI on on this. And so if you're interested in getting more quantitative results, you can always look it up there. But this is an example of a particular person, their trajectory and their predicted trajectory and their risk of having a heart attack or stroke, right? And so the black line that you see is their trajectory for their kidney functioning. And then the red line at the bottom is the likelihood of them having a heart attack or stroke. The vertical blue line is separates out times in the past that we're conditioning on for times in the future that we're that we're predicting right so you can see in the top plot uh we're not conditioning on on much and then as we move down to the bottom to the bottom plot we're conditioning on more and more of the past and trying to make predictions about the future um and basically this person's kidney functioning gets worse we're, we're actually able to predict what the trajectory is pretty well for their kidney functioning um and uh and their, um, their likelihood of having some kind of adverse event, like a heart attack or stroke go, goes up. It particularly goes up after they've already had one. Okay, so that, that kind of um, is all I have to talk about with respect to chronic kidney disease. Again, it was extremely successful from the point of view of, of can we create tools that predict chronic kidney disease well, things that you could imagine in the future being integrated into a hospital system, into a good hospital system in order to pro provide better care. But we really just didn't have the resources or hospital motivation in order, in order to do that. Um, and so we um, ended up using, coming from um, a similar standpoint with guessing processes in order to do sepsis prediction. And we are in the process of deploying a sepsis prediction um, uh, system in the hospital here at Duke. Um, and it's something that's kind of gotten more of the attention and resources from the upper level people in the hospital system here. So what is sepsis? Sepsis is um, a life-threatening complication from infection. There are 750,000 new sepsis cases every year in the U.S., and there's a high mortality rate that's associated with sepsis. 30 to 50 percent of people who have gotten it die. Um, and right now at Duke, actually we kind of stopped using it because it was so bad, but um, right now at Duke, the best thing that we have to predict whether or not somebody has sepsis is this national this new score. 
Um, and what this new score does is it says, okay, I'm going to look at a bunch of things like heart rate, like oxygen saturation level, like systolic blood pressure. And I'm going to say that this patient has some number of points, basically depending on what their values are for all of these things. And then I'm going to add them up. So each row here in this chart is a, is a different, is a different, um, feature like respiration rate or temperature and each column is the number of points that's get that gets added to the score and then if the person's score is over a certain amount they're considered high risk for having sepsis um, and there are a bunch of like really funny things about this score that was kind of made up so if you have a systolic blood pressure of 219 you're totally fine but if you have a systolic blood pressure of 220 you have three points that are added to your score right and so again um, this is a score that they tried to use um, in the hospital system. It gave off a lot of false positives. It alerted so many times that people started ignoring it and it's just not something that people have found useful in practice. And so coming out of our work on chronic kidney disease, we were like, okay, well, we can definitely make something that performs better or likely performs better. Um, and again, we use this gassing process kind of framework um, for, um, for uh, our time series modeling here, right? So what are we interested in? Again, we have a whole bunch of labs. We have a whole bunch of vitals. They're, they're um, occurring over time with the patient who's in the hospital. They're irregularly sampled. Um, so that's something that we need to, to take care of. Um, and what we really want to do in the end is be able to classify this person as uh, potentially having sepsis or not having sepsis. So what we do is we use a Gaussian process in order to estimate what, um, what lab or, or vitals values are at any given time. So we can grid up time really nicely and feed that into a classifier to estimate whether or not this person is at risk for sepsis. Um, and so, um, so this irregular, irregular sampling is something that is going to occur all the time with patients in a hospital system. They have labs, they have vitals. You never know when they're going to be taken. The frequency with which they're taken depends on exactly where they are in the hospital. If they're on the floor, they're taken less frequently. If they're in the ICU, they're taken more frequently. Right, so we use the gassing process to estimate what their lab and uh, vitals values are at, at given gridded time points. Um, even if they've never had a particular lab value, we can use looking at large numbers of people in order to estimate what it is. Um, we use a, a, a multivariate gassing process, a pretty standard one in order to do this. Um, and then we take those values and then we feed it into a classifier. And the classifier that we used is a um, is an LSTI. I'll get to it in a second. It's basically a recurrent neural net. Um, and so we can do end-to-end -end training in this gassing process recurrent neural, neural net kind of combined combined model. Um, and the the reason why this helps us is it helps us deal with a lot of data because um, we can do inference pretty quickly. Um, we can use a reparameterization check, uh, uh, reparameterization trick that was introduced by, say, like King Ma and Welling, um, in order to get gradients of of our expectation. Right, so we want to be able to minimize the expected value of a loss function, right, on, on our predictor, right, like looking at the difference between what we predict and what the actual value is for training, right? We have a loss function. We're going to say what's the expected value of the loss function. We want to minimize that in our training samples. Um, and then uh, we can approximate intractable expectations with a few Monte Carlo samples. Often people have in actuality just use one, but we found that these are actually really complicated functions that you're dealing with in, in an applied setting where, you're, we, where you have real data and real patients. So actually we use more like 10 and we find that our results get much, much better. Um, we can use conjugate gradients to compute uh, guessing process means and covariates and the Langsys method in order to efficiently draw samples from a large, from a large normal for the, for the GP. And so basically, this is a way of saying all of these tricks allow us to back back prop through um, the entire model, the Gaussian process plus classifier model. Right. And, um, it, so we have a similar setup to what we described, to what we described with chronic kidney disease. Um, we have 31 time series. 
um, with highly variable lengths of stay. Um, so that's another thing. Things can be ir irregularly sampled because um, different people stay in the hospital for different lengths of time. Um, and so we want to use uh, the clinical time series, um, a baseline covariates for the individual times of medication, uh, because you could imagine that medications that are given to a particular individual affect what lab values you see coming out. Um, and so we redefine the mean based on uh, the times that they were given uh, medications and, and a, use a, um, a particular Gaussian process kernel um, in order to do this. Uh, basically, we separate out the part of the kernel which deals with looking at correlations over time as you would in a single Gaussian process trajectory and the part of the Gaussian process kernel which can look at correlations across different lab values, right? So we have... Um, a sum, like basically we look at these two kernels, like looking at time and across law values separately, and we can product these together in order to get the kernel that we're interested in kind of most simply, and then we look at, at, summing, at summing several of these up. Um, and like I said before, we use a recurrent neural net um, with several layers for our classifier. And so here's an example, again, a motivating example of an individual person who came into the hospital system um, who uh, got sepsis and a look at our risk prediction uh, method in terms of what we predict for that individual. Okay, so they come into um, our hospital system on the left, on the y-axis, you can see the top with the dark black line is what our method predicts in terms of their probability of having sepsis. And then underneath it are things like temperature, pulse, respiration rate, et cetera, which are a whole bunch of labs and vitals which are irregularly getting, getting measured for this particular person. And this pe person came into our hospital system in order to have surgery, um, and they had the surgery, and they had the surgery successfully. Um, and then they started decompensating, and they started decompensating really badly and were eventually admitted to the ICU here at Duke. Um, and it was at, it's at this point that our, our algorithm, our method, uh, predicts that they're actually looking at their labs and values. At this time, they're actually at substantial risk of having sepsis. Um, we can get uh, additional lab values, which give more credibility to that to that. Um, that, that inference. But the blue dots basically represent when this person was administered antibiotics, right? So they were in, administered antibiotics a little bit going into surgery because that's just done um, by, by routine. But it wasn't until 180 hours, basically, that um, the doctor started inferring that this person might actually have sepsis and started administering antibiotics. And it wasn't until 36 hours, um, sorry, it wasn't until about 200 hours that, uh, that they started, that, that the person actually met the, the, um, the, all, all, they met all of the, they satisfied all of the check boxes for actually, uh, for actually meeting our definition of sepsis or meeting the definition of definition of sepsis that's used in the hospital system here at Duke. And so this is 17 hours or 36 hours, depending on how you, looked at, how you look at it, that is a very long time, right? That is a very long time in the life of a sepsis patient. And so um, what you'd like to be able to do is to say, okay, um, I can use this risk prediction model and I can shorten what this length of time is and I can start giving the person antibiotics earlier because I think that they have sepsis because the risk prediction method is telling me that they might have sepsis. Um, and this, this is what we are deploying currently in our hospital system and we're trying to do basically moving forward. Um, so uh, basically, we looked at 52,000 inpatient encounters for training. Um, this is all the data that we had here at Duke from the last 18 months, and 14,000 for testing. Uh, sorry, for, for, for the 18 months before the last six months, and 14,000 for testing, which is six, six months of data, which we used, um, which we said was going into the future, but was actually the last six months. We had 31 longitudinal variables, six vitals, and 25 labs. 36 baseline co covariates. This is uh, 29 comorbidity indicators and six demographic information kind of covariates, um, and eight different classes of medication. Right, like what kinds of kinds of medications were they administered? 
And this is a plot showing the area under the ROC curve on the left and the false, false positive um, to prediction rate on the right. And this is important because if you remember, one of the things that was problematic before was that like nurses were ignoring um, the new score when it alarmed, right, because it was going off so much. And so we want to find the right uh, sensitivity specificity um, place or our precision recall kind of like point um, in order to say we have a, an algorithm which we think gives a really good indication that the person has sepsis, but not have it alarm so much that it's ignored. Um, and so basically we compared our multivariate GP RNN combined method with a whole bunch of baseline methods, including the new score that I showed you earlier um, and just a straight up RNN and logistic regression and stuff like that. And we beat them handily at every point in time. And so we can actually do a pretty decent job if you look at the ROC curve on the left, right? We can do like uh, a 90% job of, um, of, of being able to predict that the person is 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 able to, it, sorry, that the person is about to come down with sepsis, right? So we can hopefully, again, like I showed on the last couple of slides, treat it earlier. Um, and so we're developing a web app. So one of the things uh, is that once you've developed these kinds of methods um, and you're interested in having them used in a hospital system, one of the things you have to worry about is how you take this information and, and um, and communicate it well to the people who need to be seeing it, who are interacting with the patients. Um, and so we're in the process of developing this web app that we call Sepsis Watch. And the idea is, as you see here, and this is not real data because that would obviously be a HIPAA violation, but you have the person's name on top with some of their demographic information. You have uh, on the upper left what their overall risk of having sepsis is. And then um, in a plot right underneath, um, a, uh, uh, basically a look at what their trajectory has been in terms of their risk of having sepsis over time. Um, this web app allows you to um, monitor, um, basically there are bundles for treatments of uh, sepsis. Um, and so you can look at um, uh, different kinds of bundles that you can give to patients, right? And so once you start a patient on a bundle, you kind of have to follow through. So if you look on the right, you can start treating them like Gavin Freeman for sepsis and uh, it says current treatment at three hours, you need to give them IV fluid. At six hours, you need to assess fluid response. So the web app is also capable of telling you what bundle you're in, what this person's, why this person was, was thought to have sepsis and what you need to be doing in the upcoming time period in order to satisfy that bundle. So switching gears again, sorry, this is like an overview of a whole bunch of work that we're doing. Um, we're gonna look at predicting surgical complications. And so if you remember from my outline slide in the beginning, um, this is a bit of a switch from looking solely at electronic health record data in the Duke University hospital system, which is what we've been doing, to looking at large national databases in combination with our local data. So about 15 out of every 100 surgical procedures performed uh, results in a complication. And uh, in 2014, Duke spent about $9 million on post-operative complications. So it's, it's a lot of money for the hospital system again, um, and obviously a really bad time for the patients. Um, there's something called the NISQIP data set, which is, um, a National Surgical Quality Improvement Program data set that's collected nationally. It involves over 3.7 million patients and 700 hospitals. It includes a whole bunch of like demographic information and other um, operative variables about the person. Um, and there was a JAMA article really recently, for some reason this was a surprise to them, that just belonging to this NISQIP program wasn't enough to actually improve your complication rates. You have to actually use the data for something, shocker. Um, so what we, what our goal was, was to really start using this national, sur sur national surgical quality improvement program data, data set um, in order to be able to make better predictions about what surgical complications um, patients at Duke are likely to develop. 
And just using a, a simple sparse logistic regression function, we were actually able to do a pretty good job. So on the left, on the rows in this chart, are the different kinds of surgical complications you can have coming out of surgery, like renal failure, like a cardiac problem, whatever. And then on the rightmost column gives you the AUC you get just by using sparse logistic regression, which is way more than what they do now. What they do now is like the surgeon walks into the room, they look at you and they're like, ah, I think this person's good to go into surgery, right? And so one of the things that we really want to do is, is be able to say, okay, we're using some kind of quantitative method in order to better evaluate whether this patient is actually ready to go into surgery or not, or whether they're likely to develop a complication afterwards. Um, and that's part of the goal here. Um, this is this model. One of the nice things about this model is this model is pretty interpretive, right? So it's imper interpretable. Um, so um, some of the things like uh, esophageal cancer are not things that we can probably do anything about um, with patients, but some but other things like nutritional deficiency are pot are potentially things that we can make interventions on, right? So we could we could order a nutrition consult if we feel like nutritional deficiency is actually playing um, significantly into this person being at risk of a postoperative complication. Um, and so our goal at the end of the day, like with some of the other uh, methods that I showed you, is really to have surgeons that are rounding on patients and able to look at what this individual person's distribution is in terms of postoperative complications uh, what, and what they're at risk for and what they can do about it. Um, this right here is, um, is the web app that we're developing for um, for postoperative complications. Um, so again, this is not real data, but includes the name of the person, the procedure, um, what kind of complications they're at risk for. And then again, there are treatment bundles, right? What, what it is that you can potentially do about it. And the what it is that you can potentially do about it was where we really had to work with clinicians in order to um, come up with these checkboxes. And so you've got the risk factors, the things that are really playing into them being high risk on the left and on the right, the things that you can actually intervene on. And so right now, um, we're in the process of running some clinical trials at Duke where people are rounding on patients with, with this tool. Um, and so from a machine learning standpoint, there are a whole bunch of things that you can do with this data. So one of the things is that um, a lot of what this algorithm predicts off of our procedural co codes, right? So like what the, the procedure is that the person is going through. Um, and right now those are kind of grouped together and they're grouped together by hand by physicians. And so one of the things we were interested in is can we do a better job sort of automatically grouping these together for the purpose of being able to predict better whether or not somebody's gonna have a complication. And we found that oftentimes this improves prediction. Um, another thing we looked at is, can we combine this with our own electronic health record data? Um, and so we looked at EHR data at Duke um, in terms of patients that are going in and having surgeries here. Um, and the idea is that we want to be able to say, okay, a patient comes in to get surgery. What we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to combine this national data with our local hospital data. We'd like to be able to transfer or do transfer learning between the national database and our local hospital data in order to come up with a risk profile, which is tailored for that individual patient. And then we'd like to be able to show their provider the risk profile that we've tailored uniquely for them. Um, okay, and so our approach to this, and this is basically in submission, um, is coming up with a hierarchical infinite factor model. And the hierarchical infinite factor model that we've developed accounts for a whole bunch of the underlying variability in the, in the data through a sparse decomposition of the covariance. Um, and so uh, this allows us to share information across different kinds of sources of data while, while we're adjusting to each sources of data is in idiosyncrasies. Um, so you could imagine the cohort of Duke patients looks incredibly different from national patients overall. You have all kinds of community hospitals providing data that, that's going into the national database that doesn't really describe Duke's, Duke's uh, individual patient base. Um, and so what we really did is we expanded on, um, uh, this is just a basic factor model, we expanded on a basic factor model 
um, using a hierarchical Dirichlet process in order to say, okay, we think that we have these bunch of hospitals, we will have separate weights, factor weights, factor loadings matrices for each of the different hospitals that we learn through the hierarchical Dirichlet process. Um, and each of these like learned loadings, uh, factor loadings matrices allow us to say, okay, I think this factor matters more or less at this individual hospital. So we, we allow transfer between the different hospitals, right, feeding up hierarchically through the hierarchical Dirichlet process, right, but we allow sort of different weightings to exist so that we say, okay, Duke might be a little bit different, there might be a little more variability here or there on particular factors. Um, that we're going to incorporate when we're looking at our patient base. Um, and again, we find this hierarchical infinite factor model generally does much better when it comes to prediction when compared with um, just looking at the national database, just looking at the local database, um, or just looking at a logistic regression that's lasso that's on the right. Um, one of the things that we're currently working on is speeding this algorithm up so that it looks at even more data because these national databases are really big. Um, so we're looking at using stochastic gradient nose Hoover thermostats, um, but uh, this is a sampling algorithm um, at the heart of it, and we just need to be doing something basically as, as quickly as possible because this data is really valuable. Um, we're also looking at the preoperative framework, right? So everything I showed you was postoperative, but we're looking preoperatively, can we predict who's at risk before going into surgery? Um, can we actually use this to inform what kind of consultation they have, right? So uh, patients that are deemed to be at low risk are usually given phone screens, whereas people that are at high risk are sent to very particular clinics and given more information um, and paid more attention to in terms of what they should be doing after they have surgery. So we want to be able to use machine learning risk models in order to make these assignments about which person goes into which uh, pre-surgical clinic. And then we want to be able to use machine learning algorithms to determine what kinds of interventions might be needed with this person before they go into surgery, but after they have these clinical visits. Um, and so this in, in uh, a little bit relates to uh, causal inference and how much each of these in individu individual uh, interventions are actually making a difference which, with, uh, with people in the patient population. Okay, so the very last thing I wanna do is advertise our multiple sclerosis app. And so, um, so like I said at the beginning, this is all great, but this all applies. Everything I've talked about in this talk applies to people on an inpatient basis, right? So if somebody's come into the hospital for surgery, somebody has come into the hospital and develops sepsis, et cetera. Um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to say, okay, even people who are just being monitored by the hospital system, but don't have um, a, a, a condition in which they're, they're in the hospital 24 hours a day, like we should be collecting data on them because they have diseases that are important and then using machine learning methodology in order to make predictions from um, the data that we collect. But most of that data is actually gonna be data that's collected um, at home. So multiple sclerosis is an example of one of these chronic diseases. It has very chaotic symptoms. Nobody really knows whether it's one disease or multiple diseases. The onset of the symptoms is not very predictable. The duration of the symptoms is not very predictable. The severity of the symptoms is not very predictable. So um, the question we asked is how can we monitor this continuously um, and start making sense of it? Um, and we developed this app, which we call MS Mosaic, which is right now available in the Apple App Store. So if you guys know anybody with multiple sclerosis, you can advertise this app to them because we really, really need people's data. Um, it's got an embedded consent form. It's got a disease history survey. It's got daily surveys. It's got a single notification. So if everything has been the same, is the same tomorrow as it was today, you don't really have to do anything. It's got different kinds of phone activities that have been developed for people with various kinds of neurological problems. Um, and then surveys you can fill out if you feel like you're having a relapse, if you feel like you're having new symptoms. It also passively collects data from um, wearable devices, uh, like such as, as fitness trackers through HealthKit. Um, and so here's 
here's an example of what the dashboard can look like and what um, what uh, basically a survey can look like and you can adjust what level of symptoms you feel like you're having and what and you get reports um, reports for you reports for your doctor you can take the reports are PDF for your doctor um, and so you can take them in and show them a summary of what things have been like between this doctor's visit and the last doctor's visit this was developed I should say in collaboration with some MS specialists here at Duke um, because one of the things that they complain about most frequently is um, is really uh, not being able to know how to start a conversation with their patients, right? So a patient comes in, the doctor says, how are you feeling? Um, the patient says, oh, okay. Um, and the doctor doesn't really know what to do. And so here with these PDF reports, they at least get some kind of summary which can kickstart a conversation. And we also get data. Um, so the idea here is that uh, all of these things don't take a lot of time to complete. Um, so the PDF, um, one of the PDF doctor's reports are shown on the right, some of the, some of the summaries of your symptoms for your uh, individual patient, for the individual patient consumption is shown in the middle. And then we also have, have a medication tracker, which is in calendar form on the left. Um, these show a couple of other things about the app. So on the left, we have a learn more section, which allows you to look at um, different kinds of symptoms that you might have as an MS patient, like fatigue, right? So this is in partnership with the National MS Society. And on the right, we have an example of um, a tapping task that somebody might be asked to do, right? So there are various different uh, phone tasks that you can do that will help you uh, assess how you're doing in terms of your right hand, in terms of your left hand, um, and they're, th they're things that you and your doctor can look at. Okay, um, and so with data now starting to come in over the last basically two weeks is how long this app has been out for, um, we can do a lot of the things that we've talked about um, with previous diseases over the course of this talk, right? So we can look at trying to predict the trajectory of an individual's um, disease experience. We can look at trying to discover hidden subpopulations within particular uh, within particular symptoms. For, so for example, um, a patient might be feeling tired. Why are they feeling tired? Well, it could be that they have multiple sclerosis. It could be that they're on a particular medication and that medication is making them feel tired. It could be that they're depressed and their depression is making them feel tired. And so one of the things we'd like to be able to do is separate out where this feeling of tiredness is coming from. Um, and lastly, with this disease, like all of the other ones, we're interested in really evaluating the efficacy of different interventions that we can make on a clinical basis. Okay, um, and one of the things we also plan on doing is combining this mobile app data with other kinds of data. So one of the things that happens is people have MRI scans, um, and this is in a way a way for us to learn about the brain, right? How do the symptoms that people are experiencing correlate with what we're seeing on their MRIs? Um, we can also com combine it with omics data. So there's um, a study called the Murdoch study, which has gotten uh, all kinds of uh, genetic and metabolomic information on patients, many of whom have MS. And we can look at how what somebody is experiencing uh, correlates with their genomics or metabolomics. Okay, and so the last thing I wanna say is thanks to all of my graduate students who have put in a huge amount of work on all of these projects. I didn't get around to talking about uh, Kai's influenza work, but that's also super cool. Also involves mobile apps and tracking people. Um, uh, Joe, uh, who's on the job market this year, did um, a lot of the work on sepsis and chronic kidney disease with guessing processes. And then a lot of the surgical complications work with the hierarchical infinite factor model was done um, by my student, Liz. And then, like I said, the multiple sclerosis app was, um, was developed in uh, conjunction with a multiple sclerosis neuroimmunologist uh, here at Duke. Um, and I haven't wrapped my students into that project yet just because we've only gotten data over the last two weeks. Um, yeah, so so uh, whoever asked the question about the, the sepsis, um, about the sepsis results with the period of time was correct in their inferences. 
Um, paper, yeah, so we've had a bunch of papers. So some of the chronic kidney disease stuff was published at um, UAI. Um, some of the sepsis stuff has been published um, at ICML. Um, the, it was an ICML paper this year. Um, the surgical complication stuff, again, that's in su submission. Um, you can look for the clustering part of it in JMLR. Um, and then the mobile app we haven't published on, but again, we have the app out there. Um, so that's kind of like our product there. Um, and hopefully eventually we'll have a publication, but we need to do some data analysis first. Um, yeah, so ICML this year, UA last year, JMLR, again, these past couple of years. Um, that's about it. Thanks, I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you all for listening.